Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimple the Limp, and I am here with Colonel Fetters. He was nice enough to sit down with me for a few minutes. We're going to go over Code Atlas, uh, Global War. Give me the exact name again, Code Atlas. Uh, yeah, Code Atlas, a global strategy game. A global strategy game. It is a, for me, this is like Axis and Allies uh, on steroids. Uh, we're at Tabletop Simulator here. We're going to go over quickly the game, a little bit of background, learn where it's coming from, how long it's going to take to get this actually to the table, potential Kickstarters in the future, and a quick overview of how the games play. Uh, so, Colonel Fetters, if you could take and just give me a little background, you know, how you guys started all this. I know we were just talking about how um, you guys started this right at the, the start of COVID, and you've got a fellow named Casper who's working with you doing the uh, technical aspect while you're working on the rules aspect of the game. Yeah, so I kind of started off uh, as a pet project. Um, Tequila, who's the other uh, uh, moderator, the other uh, developer, he does all the graphic design and I mean, at least in my opinion, he's, you know, an amazing graphic artist because you can see all this, you know, great artwork that he's put into the game. Uh, we've been working for about two and a half years or so. Uh, like, like you said there, it's me. We started right around, right before COVID hit. Um, and again, it started off kind of as a, just a, a fun pet project uh, but between the two of us, just sort of putting something together uh, and it just kind of grew from there. And as we got people, um, kind of involved in it and people play testing it, it just sort of got, you know, bigger and bigger and we just, you know, kept it going. So hopefully uh, sometime in the future, we don't really have any kind of timetable because we really want to put out, you know, a good polished product before it goes out to, you know, the, the general public. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at. I should definitely address that. What you guys are seeing right now is very much an alpha stage. We're not even in beta stage here. So take that with a grain of salt. A lot of this is has the potential to change in the future. So just keep that in mind. These are all placeholders for now for what you'll see, you know, down the road when the game uh, approaches completion. Uh, right. I would like it if we could, you know, get a quick overview of what the game does, like the the general principle of the game, and then go into a, a sequence of play, just a general gist of all that. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you've ever played um, Axis and Allies or any other sort of area control sort of uh, game like that, you'll see probably some things that let, look familiar to you. Uh, however, unlike with Axis, where it's very rigid as to, you know, you have the Axis and you have the Allies and there's really no more player interaction than the actual battles themselves. Uh, in Code Atlas, we, we tried to uh, once modernized it, so obviously it's not during set during World War II. It's just set in you know modern times or the very near future. Um, but we also tried to implement a lot more things like politics, uh, economics, and a lot more player interactions. So if you're familiar with games like uh, Twilight Imperium, for example, uh, where there's a lot of dealing going on, a lot of uh, sort of backstabbing, secret deals. There's a lot more of that in this game than there would be in like a typical sort of Axis and Allies where everything's sort of already set in place. You know, in, in this game, you could have uh, you know, the United States fighting the UK rather than them being allies. So it's really up to the players as to how they want to play it. Yeah, that was one of the things that uh, intrigued me as I sat down, I was reading over the rules. Um, and I know you'll you'll touch on this later, but one of the things I really liked is you refer to it as like the conflict the conflict phase of the game. And that's because it's mm -hmm. not purely combat. There's actually a diplomatic side to that as well. So you're not just out there trying to destroy everyone. There is wheeling and dealing going on behind the scenes as well. Yeah. And if you play your cards right, you can actually earn enough points in this game to win without really going into all out war with any other player. Now that's not easy to do. Uh, obviously having a big army and being able to throw your weight around is, is, you know, is nice. It makes it a lot easier for you, but it is possible to win the game purely through diplomacy, but it is tough. Uh, that I'll definitely say that for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm looking at it now and I see a bunch of the different colors. So as I understand it, there are five different factions to the game, right? Yes. So there are five, uh, playable factions now unfortunately uh as the game is set now we really don't have it balanced for anything less than that so um 
you kind of need all five players for the games to sort of work properly as far as balancing goes. We would love to be able to get it to the point where you could play, you know, uh, less than five. But as of right now, that's sort of how we've been developing the game. Uh, now, there also are, if you see uh, looking at the colors there, we also have two non-player factions. We call those the neutrals and the rebels, the cyan and the brown. Uh, and as a player, you can interact with them as well through either you know, fighting them if you want to take over one of those uh, neutral countries. Or we actually have proxy war mechanics where you can actually set uh, neutrals against one another, against rebels or against you know, you know, your own enemies. Um, so you don't always have to be fighting with your own troops, just like in real life, you know, governments and, and countries will often try to pit smaller countries against each other rather than getting themselves involved you know, in a, in a bigger conflict. Oh, so almost kind of like what we're seeing with uh, Ukraine and Russia, not to touch on modern day politics too much, but in that NATO right. is kind of influencing what Ukraine's doing, them, uh, doing, giving them supplies. It's a similar type thing with uh, the rebels and the neutrals, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And, um, you know, cause, because it is something that's been going on, I mean, since you know, for, forever, really. But, you know, think back to the Cold War and, and then and obviously now, you know, with, with uh, the conflicts going on. And we've sort of uh, tried to implement those sort of mechanics because it is an important part of, you know, global politics and, and strategy and things like that. So which are the five different player factions? Sure. So uh, the United States is the is white. Uh, they have there obviously the uh, mainland U.S., uh, but they also have several islands, especially in the Pacific and different places throughout the world that are you know U.S. territory to begin with. Uh, you have the tan color, kind of yellowish tan. That is the the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, I guess more in, generally. Um, they are probably the most spread out of any of the factions. Again, reflecting kind of real world scenario, you have uh, Canada, Great Britain itself, obviously, South Africa, um, India and Australia, as well as some Pacific islands uh, where uh, you can find those factions uh, sort of base of operations. We have the, the blue is the EU. Again, they're mostly there in, uh, in mainland Europe. Um, but they do have one home region in South, uh, South America and French Guiana. Um, green is, uh, the Russian player, uh, again, in basically what's, you know, mainland Russia there. And then the last one in red is China, uh, in what is, you know, considered China in, in the real world. Now, are all of these factions similar in the way that they play or do they have any like special characteristics that distinguish them from the other factions? Yeah, good question. Um, as of right now, the, the factions themselves are fairly similar. Obviously, geography and their starting positions are different from one another. Um, they all start off with the same base amount of uh, what we call GDP is our sort of in-game currency. Uh, they all start with the same amount of GDP to begin with um, and fairly similar as far as uh, starting resources within their home regions. Um, however, one thing that can give it a bit more of a, an asymmetrical feel is our um, government uh, mechanic. So each faction will then also choose a government type, and that is going to give you unique bonuses or uh, abilities that you can do. So you know, once the game starts, you know, even though each faction has sort of the same units and kind of starting off uh, similarly having those different um, government mechanics as well as then when we get into the technology, you know, what each country chooses to focus on as far as technology really then starts to set them apart from one another. So can we do this a historically, like can America be communist or socialist or uh, what are the different political type ideologies you can go with? Yeah. So if you look down here, I'm going to ping it for you real quick down. So the uh, bottom left of the map, oh, we have awesome. 10 uh, unique um, governments. Now, currently, the, the symbols here are placeholders. We're, we're going to be developing our own uh, symbols for these. But as you can see, we have you know, democracy, republics, monarchies, technocracy, oligarchy, uh, federation, communism, plutarchy, totalitarianism, totalitarian and dictatorship. And as you can see there, each one does have its own uh, sort of unique abilities or, or bonuses to it. 
Oh, wow. I had missed this when I was going over the rules. That is freaking awesome. I love that. And you're saying that you can pick that when you start the game, you can pick any of the 10 to start your faction off as? Right. So actually every round of, of the ga- of gameplay, you may change uh, your government. So you can tailor it to what your plans are going to be for that round, as long as it's not already chosen by another player. Since there's 10 different um, governments, so we have five players, there's always going to be five government types available that uh, you can choose from. And then we also have, uh, just to you know, throw another wrench into things, um, a couple of our diplomacy, I can't remember if it's in the diplomacy deck or in the espionage deck, but you can actually force people to change um, governments through some of the uh, technology cards, which can you know, really make players uh, unhappy with you, especially if they get something they don't want, or you can sh- choose, make, make them change their plans, so to speak. And we can get, talk about that. We get more into the, the cards a bit later on. See, this is what captured my attention when I first started reading about this game is the, the political intrigue to it. There seems to be so much more of that in this game than you see in any other games similar to this. You know, all the other yeah. games, they focus on combat, just big masses of balls of units moving across uh-huh. the map, you know. And this, you're working towards a completely different angle. Speaking mm-hmm. of which, uh, can yes. you address the uh, the victory conditions? Because it's not just world conquest, what you're shooting for here. Right. So um, we have a uh, victory point system. It's actually up here kind of in the upper left corner. Um, and it's kind of a simple thing. You know, first person to 10 victory points um, or higher uh, wins the game. Um, now, the way to earn those victory points is actually pretty simple. If you look on the map, there are these cyan colored victory cities. Like for example, here, you know, you have Caracas in Venezuela, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, you know, just, if you look around, there are, um, lots of these, what we call victory cities. So if you control a victory city and when we talk about controlling a territory, you can control it militarily by having your infantry units stationed there, or you can control it diplomatically. We have a uh, embassy tokens, which I can show you here. Um, I'll just grab a U.S. diplomatic or embassy token. So let's see here, maybe in Cairo, right? So if I have my embassy here in Egypt, that gives me control of this country. So I get the the country's GDP, which would be six here for Egypt. And I also gain that victory city uh, as a point towards uh, my eventual victory. Now, is there something that beats out – does uh, a military unit beat out an embassy or embassy beat out a military unit for control? So, yeah, so um, em- or military units can uh, destroy embassies, uh, so that sort of trumps the, the embassy there. Uh, and there's also a lot of um, diplomatic, you know, different technology cards. Uh, even some of the governments are able to remove or, or replace embassies. Uh, and then the uh, the special abilities that are tied to the turn order, uh, the very first um, turn, so that whoever chooses the, the first turn order, uh, one of their abilities is they get to remove an embassy while placing their own embassies. So sometimes these countries can change hands pretty quickly, even without any combat happening. Oh, that's that is awesome. Uh, now that you bring up the, the turn, uh, turn order, that's one of the things that kind of captured my attention as well is in the fact that everything is done based on the turn order but it's established through kind of a bidding war at the start of the game or at the start of the round should i say yeah yes yeah each round uh, so basically each round ends with a bid that then sets the turn order for the next round uh the way we do it is sort of a, a victory auction so if you take a look um Well, for you, you're able to see into all these sort of hidden areas. Like right now, I'm uh, the United States player, so I can only – I can see this little counter right here, but all the other ones are shaded out so that I can't see them. And so what you would do is like for me as the USA player, um, I want to bid my GDP, which is my currency, uh, to try to – if I would – if I want to be able to – the person who picks you know, where I go in the turn order first – then I want to have the highest bid. So actually, if you want to, uh, go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and do the U.S. If you want to click and make some bids on the other um, uh, little markers there, I'll show you one of the uh, uh, scripts that we have. So uh, we have a 
luckily we have a, uh, a developer who helps us out now and then, and he is great at setting up scripting uh, here in TTS. And so once we have bids and everyone has their bid in, if you take a look right up here to the above you there, okay. we can press this little dollar sign button. And actually, why don't you go ahead and do that? Right there? Yep, right there. And oh, so that brings sweet. out all the bids. It puts them in order. And because it's a Vickery auction, the way it works is um, whoever gets the highest bid, they pay what the second highest person bid. And then it goes on down to the person who bid the least pays nothing. Now, is there any benefit to going later or is it just the fact that you're saving that income? Yeah, basically, you're, if, if you don't kind of care where you end up in the uh, – turn order, then you know, saving your income might be a benefit over spending it at this point in, in the game. Um, and just because you have the highest bid doesn't mean you necessarily go first. You just get to choose where in the turn order you go. Okay. So it's not that you're getting first place. You're picking right. first through. Fifth. You're getting first pick. Yeah. So actually, if you come over here to the left a little bit, you'll see these are the actual turn orders. And so these little guys actually come off of here and we kind of just sort of place them down. And so then in this case, the United States, since they bet 22, they would get first pick. So I would grab my United States marker and I would decide, you know, which of these uh, points in the turn order I would want to go. Now, choosing the first uh, turn order, that allows you to place two uh, embassies. So that's a way you can basically take territory and I get to remove someone else's embassy. Um, but once you get past the third turn, uh, third place, fourth and fifth do not get any embassies. It's a little more militarily focused because if you think about the way the tor turn order works, if I'm going last, I get to react to everybody else's moves. So I kind of have the advantage militarily. I see what everyone else does and then I get to decide you know, if I'm going to make that, that sneak attack and then people can't do anything about it. Right? Whereas if you're going first – you have to make the moves first, but you do get a diplomatic bonus to it. So we're trying to balance it out that way. Whereas, you know, going first gives you a, a bonus here, you know, with diplomacy. However, you're kind of uh, setting the stage with the military or you're, you're you don't get a chance to react to anybody else, if that makes sense. Now, looking at the rest of those in the turn order, based on the color, I'm assuming that means that that's uh, neutral and rebel units that you get to place. Correct. Yes. So again, kind of going with the whole idea of, you know, giving arms or, or equipment to, um, you know, third party countries, you know, the second, third and fourth places in the turn order get to um, provide uh, basically assistance to and add units to these uh, neutrals and rebels, which can be good if you're trying to defend a country that maybe one of your enemies is trying to take over and you don't want that to happen. You can bolster that country's defenses or let's say you want to do a proxy war. You can build up troops in a country and then later on, if you have a card or a government ability that you can then use those units and attack uh, a neighboring country. Uh, and the way our proxy war system works is if, if your uh, neutrals or rebels win that proxy war, you actually gain an embassy in that country. Oh, so that's so cool. So winning those proxy wars can actually help you gain territory, even though your troops were never involved, you know, at all. So uh, if I understand this correct, the, the rebels will always be aggressive towards you, but neutrals can be on your side? No. So the way it actually works is, um, let's say, for example, if we go back to, uh, to Egypt, where I've set down that embassy, um, having an embassy here means I have political control over this country. However, if I move any of my own troops into this country, even with an embassy, uh, I will have to attack. Uh, so even, you know, neutrals, rebels doesn't really matter. The reason we have two different factions is that you can actually have them fight one another, you know, so like neutrals can attack another neutral or rebels can attack another rebel, but you can attack each other. I guess, you know, one, a rebel can attack a neutral and vice versa. Now, if I wanted to put my own troops in Egypt, what I can then do is we actually have a military base. Uh, and so if I drop this military base here in Egypt, what that does is it now allows me to place my own troops here and not have to fight those neutrals or rebels. And if I'm attacked, they'll assist me uh, in that um, in that combat. OK, but the, there's no way to get rebels on your side then. Uh, well, yeah, let's say if I owned – let's say I had my embassy here in Yemen, Oman, 
and I place a uh, military base here, I could now put U.S. troops in Yemen and these rebels will come to my defense if I was attacked there. OK, I, I got you now. They they both kind of act the same. They're just different yes. colors. So you can pit them against each other. Exactly. Okay. Yep. You got it. I got you now. Uh, and the other cool thing about the military bases I'll just mention now is that um, they act kind of like a teleport pad. So if I have, you know, some troops maybe in my my capital region and which is where I, actually the only place you can uh, originally place new units um, during the air movement phase, I could actually move those units from one military base to another, you know, instantaneously. So think of them like little teleport pads to get your units farther afield in, in the in the uh, the world. Because when you think about modern modern era, you know, we have those military bases all over the place. You know, big C one thirties that are transporting troops, you know, here, there, and everywhere. So we've kind of added that mechanic to it to try to make it so it's less. Um, you know, defending your home territory and then slowly working out from there, you can easily drop troops anywhere around the world as long as you have an embassy and you can place a base there. So when you're talking about deploying your units only into your your capital or the military bases, is it just that one specific capital like you would only deploy to Washington if you were America? So uh, the capitals are the, the yellow city. So if you look at America, like you said, uh, I have four capitals, actually, Washington, uh, New York, and then on the West Coast, we have uh, Los Angeles, and then we also have Honolulu in Hawaii. So those are the four places where I can spawn new units as the United States. Um, and then from there, you know, I, if I have a military base in San Francisco uh, or in, in California there, I could then teleport them, transport them, you know, to other military bases further afield or – they can just march there on their own. But it's much easier, you know, if you have a military base in, you know, somewhere in the Middle East, you know, rather than having to walk there or drive there from the United States, we can you can just use those uh, military bases to transport your troops. Well, since we are kind of addressing the military units and the purchasing aspect of it, I want mm -hmm. to touch on the fact that it's not just GDP. It's not just spending money to get Correct. those units. There are other resources that you have to go for. Yeah. So if you take a look at the map, you'll see there's uh, four different kinds of resources. Uh, there's food, uh, which is kind of the cyan green color. Yet yeah, it sort of uh, looks like a fish or a uh, wheat. Uh, there's oil, which is the, the, the drop of crude oil there. Uh, minerals, which are the brown, like here in Sudan, for example. And then uranium, which is the yellow, the U92. And so each unit has not only the GDP cost, but also a resource cost as well. And much of the infrastructure also has that. Um, yeah, looking down here, you can actually see, you know, what each unit costs and, um, you know, what resources and, and GDP and everything else. Oh, that is cool. I love that because it's easier in some games that you're just worried about building up the money, but now you can't mm -hmm. do that. You have to focus on making sure you have access to the different types of resources that you're going to need for the different Correct. types of units that you're going to be bringing to the board. I love that. That is, that's what I'm talking about. Access and allies just taken to the 10th level, man. And the, the home regions, you know, where you kind of start, you have a few resources to get you going, but if you really want to start, you know, building things up, you're going to have to, again, either militarily or di diplomatically, start taking some of those other uh, those other regions where they're much more resource uh, heavy. Okay. I see on the, the board here where it shows resource uh, storage and it's got little mm -hmm. counters that you can uh, tick up. What are you thinking for the actual game itself? Just uh, sets of tokens that you would hold on to for these pieces to represent how many you have? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, if I can show you here real quick. So one nice thing about having – you know, the TTS mod um, is we can automate a lot of this stuff. So for example, I'm just going to grab a few resource markers from the board. So when you um, capture resources using your ports and, and trade hubs and things like that, what happens is you bring these resource markers. So I'm just going to grab a few down into this uh, income resource box. And yeah, I grab a few more. Here we go. And then I'll also show you for the GDP, if you take a look kind of just below the map, we have these markers here. And so for like the United States, let's say I'm at 70 GDP, which is where we start. If my marker is placed here, right, and then the resource tokens are in this box, 
and I press this collect button. Actually, why don't you go ahead and do that? Oh, wow. He has done some work on this. I love that. So if you see the GDP um, counter here automatically updates, and then you saw the, the resource tokens drop in. Now, if you don't want to, you can physically drag these out and, and look at them, place them back, or you can use these plus and minus buttons to uh, just quickly add or remove resources that right. way. You're, you're spoiling people. When they, when <laughs> yeah. they get the real game, they're going to be looking for the button to push to bring all the tokens in. Yeah, for sure. No, that is, uh, that's excellent. Do you have it automated for the units as well? Yeah, so actually I was just about to say, if you take a look up here at the top, this is what we call the, the build queue. These are your starting units, and there's a button right here that says buy. So if you click on that, why don't you go ahead and do that? All right, so now if you come down to the units – these little plus and minuses are actually now buttons that you can click on. So for example, like once you click on a, the plus sign for the aircraft carrier. So now it says you're going to have be building one of them. And if you take a look up here, it actually tells you, here's your GDP that it's going to cost. It's going to cost you one mineral, one palm. Uh, well, it, it used to be palm oil. We changed it to food just more generally. So that hasn't been updated yet. Uh, and then one uranium. Now, so then a, a delay for these units once they're purchased between. Go the ahead and hit. Go ahead and hit the confirm button, and it just brings that carrier out and places it on your uh, your player board here. So that right there was your carrier. Let me let me do it again. What if you're maybe zoomed in a little easier? I'll show you. Let me grab a I'll hit the buy button again. Let's do a bomber, a couple infantry, maybe a cruiser, and they hit the confirm, and there they come out and get placed onto your uh, your player mat. Oh, that is awesome. I love that. And the other the other great thing is that it also automatically then deducts your GDP and your resources from your uh, your counter and from your resource bins. I would be so spoiled. I would want to go <laughs> back to the, to the board game version after doing this. That is excellent. He has really done yeah. a good job with this tabletop simulator mod. It is excellent. So, yeah, it's 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 really cool. And there's, there's a few other things that uh, – we're going to hopefully have scripted, but uh, our developer who does our scripting is a very, very busy guy. And so, um, you know, we're, we're trying not to bother him too much with uh, fixes and things like that. So when we get closer to, you know, releasing it, we'll make sure that, you know, all the script is, you know, doing what it's supposed to do. <laughs> but every once in a while, we get some bugs that we got to try to tweak. Oh, that's understandable. I mean, for the amount of time you guys have been working on this, this is excellent. It looks great. And just like you were saying earlier, you've always got a line mm -hmm. of people trying to to jump into this. And by the way, don't let me forget uh, towards the end of this video, I'll make sure we uh, tell people how they can join the Discord and uh, get involved with the game if they are interested. But, yeah, that'd be great because we're always looking for more playtesters, you know, new eyeballs, taking a look at things, you know, seeing what – you know, maybe what we're not seeing as far as things that could be tweaked, fixed, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, the next thing I wanted to kind of get into is we've been talking about a lot about the aspects of the game. Can you kind of give us mm -hmm. an overview of a turn? Just, you know, pick up action and how they would go through it. Yeah, sure. So actually, if you look uh, right here below the map, uh, we have our sort of a typical round. So. We would start here. Well, after the auction, after the bidding is done, uh, the first thing is to activate uh, the cards. And this is where you choose your government type. And this is where we actually choose technology cards. Um, over here on the far left, this is you know the technology market, uh, as we call it. And each round, there are four cards drawn from each deck. Actually, let me do this a little faster here. Let's grab the next one there. One. Oops. All right, there we go. And so those cards will then be flipped. And these are the possible technology that players can choose for that round. And in turn order, uh, each player uh, will pick a certain number of cards based on where they are in the victory tracker. So from zero to two points, you get two card picks. From three to four, you get three. Uh, five to six, you get four. Seven and up, you get five. 
Um, and you can pick from the same deck as much as you want. You can pick from multiple decks. You know, it's really up to you. Uh, some of the government types, like Technocracy, actually allows you to pick first, even if you're not first in turn order, which is kind of a, a fun little uh, mechanic there. So um, giving you a, a bonus on that. And we have five decks. Uh, the top deck is the Diplomacy deck in blue. This tends to focus on... Uh, embassies, you know, gaining you new embassies or sniping other people's embassies. It also has cards that let you interact with the neutral countries, uh, lets you do proxy wars, lets you move uh, neutral units or add extra neutral units um, to a region. Uh, the second deck is the uh, military deck. And typically this deck allows you to uh, gain free military units, um, specialized attacks or if you see ones that have these little um double chevron symbol those are what we call permanent upgrades so you place those in your player board and then you are uh, able to use that upgrade for your units so like silent hunter um you could either use it to give you three free submarines or if you want to choose the uh the upgrade you gain plus two movement for your submarines for the rest of the game um We've got the uh, Espionage, which is basically the deck that lets you kind of screw with other players. Um, you can freeze their units. You can freeze their um, their economy. Uh, the rigged election one is fun. You can like force them to – this one uh, forces them to change governments, which again can be kind of annoying if your whole round was planned on uh, you know being a certain government. Um, allows you to take units out of fights, you know, all kinds of things. Um, it's kind of the, the fun deck because you get to really mess with the other players quite a bit. Uh, infrastructure, kind of what it sounds like, giving you some uh, bonuses to your, your infrastructure, your income, your GDP, that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes giving you free units or free infrastructure pieces. Uh, and then the last um, deck is got three different types of cards. The first one uh, shows a region of the world and allows you to add or remove victory cities. So if you've got a pretty good lockdown on, let's say, for this example, East Asia, you could add yourself a victory city into one of those countries that currently does not have one and give you yourself another point. Or you could use it to take away a victory city from a region that someone else controls. Oh, that's cool. The, I like that. Yeah, there's, there's uh, the bounties. So basically you get a, a random country – within a certain region and whoever can get their troops there. Uh, I don't know exactly which this one it says uh, player who controls the given territory with at least three infantry at the end of the round captures it and gains the permanent following tech plus two movement for all your fighter jets and bombers. So they're kind of like a, you know, a quick mission like, Hey, whoever can get here first is going to get a, a, an upgrade. And then there are global events where um, you can, do things that are going to affect uh, maybe movement or might lock down an enemy's troops in a certain region um, based on, you know, the event there that's, that's going on like a hurricane or a sandstorm or something like that. So you said with these cards, they only refill once per round. So everyone's got to pick from whatever is available in turn e order for this round. And then the next round you'll get new cards to choose from. You'll get new cards. Yep. Um, now, there are some, like I mentioned before, some uh, government types that might allow you to um, draw cards from the deck, things like that. So there are some special abilities that, you know, you might be able to. I think it is uh, – is it totalitarian? No, dictatorship. Um, if there are no uh, permanent upgrades left in the military deck choice, you can actually draw another card from the deck just to see if you can get some uh, some other bonus um, so there are there are ways around that rule, but yeah, you're right. Generally, these are the texts we have for this round. Once they're gone, you know, and the next round starts, we'll clear whatever's left over and throw out all new cards. And each deck has approximately 30 cards. That's our kind of goal right now. We're missing a few for some of the decks, but uh, for the most part, each one has about 30 unique cards in it. Oh, that's great. With all the, the variants to the cards, every game's going to feel different because the five different decks all being shuffled differently for each mm -hmm. of the games drawn in different orders. Uh, it, no game's going to be predictable just with these cards alone. I like that. Yeah, it does, does give it much more of an asymmetric feel, especially since 
again, with the factions themselves, there's not a whole lot of difference except, you know, geography and starting location. So this really gives it that flavor and gives it that, you know, replayability because every time, like you said, you're getting a whole new set of technologies and, you know, our, uh, it, it's fun watching our, our play testers because there's some cards that they really love. And when they pop up, it's, it's really a fight over, you know, who's getting certain cards and things like that. And it, you know, the, the very first part of the round can already start off with some people with some hurt feelings and some, uh, vendettas to, uh, <laughs> to go after throughout the rest of the round. So it, it always, it starts off already with competition, uh, before you even get into any of the military movement or anything like that. All right. And you said these are the tech cards, right? Yeah. So we call these uh, technology cards. Uh, any of the decks just generally referred to as technology cards. So then the next uh, phase of the game would be the political influence phase of the game, correct? Correct. So when you move on to the political influence phase, uh, this is where if your uh, government has any sort of special abilities, most of them are taken – care of during this part of the round and then also when where we saw with the turn order right this is where all this stuff takes place so this is where like if you're the first turn order you get to place two free embassies and remove another person's embassy and then player two can place an embassy and then also those neutral units and so on one thing we found uh, uh, what ends up happening here a lot of times is um, right off the bat you know players will start making deals right away. So it's like, Hey, I'm going to remove an embassy. Who's going to pay me to not remove their embassy. And then you already start with, you know, uh, um, sometimes bidding wars start happening. And again, there's, there's a lot of room for conflict, even within just the politics of it, you know, even though there's not really any shots being fired. (laughs) So so pretty much anything goes like any wheeling and dealing is allowed when it comes to this. Yeah. So that's one of the things we've really tried to keep as, unencumbered as possible is, um, you know, player interaction, because that's really where a lot of the fun comes from is the, you know, the making the deals, um, you know, holding people's hands over the fire, you know, you know, give me some resources or I'm going to put these troops somewhere where you're not going to like it, that kind of thing. And so, you know, you can trade resources, you can trade money, you can, uh, uh, trade, you know, units, all sorts of things. It's, it's pretty much, uh, there's very few, I should say, um, restrictions on what players are allowed to do uh, with each other. Uh, the only hard and fast rule we kind of have there is if anything is actually exchanged, whether it's GDP or resources, whatever agreement was made is going to be binding for that round. Um, but if you just say, I'm going to do this and nothing actually changes hands, you know, it's up to you if you want to actually do it or not. So you can lie unless resources were exchanged. Basically, yeah. Like if you said, hey, I'm going to pay you to not attack me, then it's a kind of a binding deal, at least for that round. The next round, you know, game on. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. I love that. Giving the the player the agency to make the choices. Yeah. And so if you if you join our Discord Discord server, what you'll see is we have a lot of uh, several voice channels because what ends up happening is. Uh, as soon as, you know, the even even during the technology card round, but especially during this politics uh, influence round, you'll have players saying, hey, can I go talk to you privately in this channel over here? And, you know, maybe the U.S. and you know U.K. might drop down to a separate channel and make make a deal, um, you know, and it's, it's always funny when you see, you know, players all leave and there's one player sort of left in the chat by themselves. And it's like, oh, you're you know, something bad's going to happen to you. I think <laughs> they got they got a feeling the nukes are on their way. Exactly, exactly. All right, so after we finish the political influence phase, that's when mm-hmm. the movement phase takes effect, correct? Um, not yet. So oh, first wait, is the buy, buy phase. phase. Yep. And so like I showed you there, this is where you use your resources to purchase your infrastructure and all the units that you're going to be placing down later in the round. So the buying happens first, and then the actual placement of those units happens closer to the end. Okay, so in essence, you kind of have to prep for your attacks the round before. Yes, yes. Fair enough. Yeah. So how are we going to move our units? I know we were already talking about military bases being important when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the movement phase is actually broken up into three. One thing we found in the early sort of iterations of the game was that, and if you've ever played a game like Axis and Allies, um, there's a lot of downtime, right, where you're waiting for someone to move every single one of their units and you know, think about what they want to do. And, you know, it might be 
half an hour or more till it's your turn again. So what we wanted to avoid that. And so what we ended up doing um, is breaking movement up into three sections. So we had start off with our ground forces. So in turn order, all the players will move their ground forces. It's their tanks, their infantry and missiles. If they're not being fired, just, you know, moving them from one territory to another. Uh, after everyone's done all their infantry or their, their ground forces, then we move on to Navy. So this is where you're moving all of your ships. Uh, this is where you can then pick up your infantry and transport them to, you know, other, uh, areas using your cruisers. Um, then once everyone's done all their naval movement, then we move on to the air phase. This is where everyone moves their planes, their fighter jets, their bombers. And this is then when uh, transport through military bases happens as well. Um, so that waits till till the very end. Am I correct that that's a missile symbol right there? So we have the, the one on the left, that's our military base. Uh, the middle is our bomber, and then the right is the uh, the fighter jets. Oh, I was thinking, of like, are, are we moving cruise missiles during this point? Because it says missile fire over here. Yeah, so actually right here, this is our missile um, uh, symbol. And so this is where, like, cruise and nuclear missiles can, like, physically move, not be fired, but, like, transport them from one territory to another, you know, put them on a truck and, and drive them somewhere. Yeah. And then later on is where the missiles actually fly if, if they're going to be fired. Okay. So where do we go from there? So during movement phase, obviously you might have a place where, you know, two people want to be in the same territory, right? And, and conflict occurs. And the, the way we, uh, we do that, let's, uh, I'm just going to grab some, uh, units here just as an example, you know, let's say I'm in, um, Oh, let me just pick a good spot. Okay, let's just say I'm here in uh, uh, in Yemen, right? And I want to send these tanks over to Saudi Arabia. So in the movement phase, I would do that. And then what I would happen is I would place down what we call a conflict marker. And this shows that I am the aggressor in that particular uh, attack. After that, if other players move in, they can then decide if they're going to join me or join the defenders. Um, but that is sort of my initiation because later on what will happen after we've done all the conflicts is each of these conflict markers will add to your defcon which pushes you closer to becoming a nuclear target for other players um, and we can talk about that a little bit later on but um, so what happens next is once we've done all the movement once all the conflicts have been initiated it goes off to the negotiation phase and here uh, is where you can try to talk it out. Let's say you realize, you know what, I'm not going to win this battle. You know, maybe more troops have been moved in. Things have changed uh, since when I initially moved my troops. Uh, if you can come to an agreement, you're able to maybe withdraw um, your troops or come up, come with, come up with some kind of uh, some kind of negotiation, some kind of peace deal to avoid uh, the conflict. Now, if that happens, you still increase your DEFCON because you initially made that you know uh, that aggressive act. Um, but there is a chance for, for peace, you know, before the bullets start flying. Now, when you're talking uh, about that, I'm assuming yeah. that when it comes to neutrals and rebel factions, there is mm -hmm. no potential for peace. If you move aggressively against them, there will be combat or is there a potential for uh, a diplomatic resolution there? So with neutrals and rebels, you have the option to retreat if you decide you know, I actually don't want to do this fight. You can back out. Um, so neutrals and rebels will always allow a retreat. But if there's another player involved, both players or all – if there's multiple players, everyone has to come to an agreement. If you can't come to an agreement with them, all the actual human players, then the combat is going to occur. So if America moved into the area you were just talking about here mm -hmm. and then China moved in their forces into that region, for yes. America to withdraw, China would have to agree. Exactly. OK, I got gotcha. you. Yep. If it was just the neutrals, if I decided, you know what, I actually don't want to attack Saudi Arabia, I could retreat. Um, again, I would still have to, you know, place my conflict marker into the DEFCON and push myself closer to, uh, you know, being a nuclear target. But, you know, maybe I'm not going to lose the battle or whatever, for whatever reason you have to, to not do that. Maybe another player convinced you that that's not going to be a good move for you because, they're about to attack it in another turn or something like that. I don't know. Whatever you guys, whatever the players end up, you know, 
uh, coming up with. So see, and again, that's one of the things that caught my attention with this game is the fact that combat is or conflict rather isn't yeah. automatically combat. And that's the why you've got it, you know, worded that way. It's a conflict. It can potentially mm-hmm. be diplomatically resolved. You know, yes. you, you don't see that in pretty much any other types of war games. It's always if you move your units in there, you're performing an assault, you're going to attack them, you'll roll your mm-hmm. dice and do whatever you're going to do. And in here, you have that uh, opportunity to do wheeling and dealing. And I'm assuming just like you were talking about earlier, that there can be money or resources involved, like I'll Definitely. allow you to withdraw if you give me some oil or, you know, whatever the yeah. case is. Yeah, exactly. And that's that happens a lot, actually, in, in the play tests that we've been doing. Uh, um, again, sometimes it is a fight that, you know, if they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely taking over this this territory. But other times, you know, especially if, you know, another player joins in and you weren't expecting that, that's when you can really hold it over someone's head and say, you know what? Well, maybe, yeah, give me some oil, give me some money and uh, I will, you know, not wipe your army off the face of the earth. So, um and speaking of which, uh, if the negotiations fail, if you take a look down there on the uh, the board again, the next thing that happens is missile fire. So to add to these conflicts, you have uh, cruise missiles, which um, will automatically destroy two units or one infrastructure. And it's of the attacker's choice, which is a little bit different. As we'll see later in combat, uh, what units get destroyed are usually the um, the choice of the defender. With the, the cruise missiles, the attacker says, I'm going to take out this tank and, you know, this infantry, right? They get to choose, you know, who gets taken out there. And then there's actually uh, nuclear weapons as well, which destroy any units and infrastructure in the region. Uh, and then that region becomes impassable and basically is removed as a viable, you know, location for resources or anything uh, for the duration of the game. Oh, so the space effectively just gets taken out permanently. Yeah. And because it's CTS and we can, uh, we've got a, a cool little nuclear symbol here. And what we can do is actually turn on the fire. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I love Just that. to give it that extra little flair. Now, in the board game, if you light your own nuclear tokens on fire, that's on you. But, you know, probably wouldn't end up too well. Oh, that is that's amazing. Now, one of the things about that, though, is when you take that step to nuke something, then that opens you up to being nuked and nukes aren't just yes. freely available in the game. Right. It has to be worked up to nu- uh, nuclear war. Correct. Yeah. Now, actually, every faction has two missiles that they start with and you can choose if you want them to be cruise missiles or nuclear missiles. So everyone can technically start the game with up to two nukes right off the bat. However, your home territories, if you take a look at like Europe, for example, is right in the middle of the board. Any country with a flag, like the EU flag here, for example, uh, we call those your home regions. And to start the game, all of your home regions are not able to be nuked by other players. You kind of have a safe zone. However, any uh, non-home regions, so anything that's not uh, a flag territory, is a nuclear target from the get-go. However... Anybody who use a nu- nu- uses any nuclear weapons at any point throughout the game will automatically move themselves into DEFCON 1. And when you're in DEFCON 1, your home regions are now fair game for other players to attack. Now, if they attack, they also will then go into DEFCON 1 if they use, you know, if they f- fire a nuke at you too. Um, so it's kind of a trade. Sometimes it's a good idea. Sometimes it might not be. Uh, the same thing with your capitals. Um, like for again, example, in Europe you have um, you know Berlin and Paris, Rome and Bucharest. Uh, if a player invades another player's capital region at any point throughout the game, even without nukes, just you know a, a land invasion, let's say, that will also push them into DEFCON one. Oh, now, really? as a player, I could attack you know Greece, I could attack you know the Baltic states or Poland, maybe if I'm the Russian player. But if I attack Romania, that's going to put me in DEFCON one right away, just like using a nuke would. So it kind of gives you a little breathing room at the beginning of the game. It slows the game down a bit, especially in those early rounds. Um, What we were finding before we had that was that people were doing sort of capital rushes like round one of the game and things were ending way too quickly and it wasn't very satisfying. So we came up with those uh, mechanics to try to, like I said, slow things down for a few rounds, let everyone get a chance to 
you know, get some things built up and then start making those big moves. Basically, everyone started with the two nukes and 10 nukes got launched in round one. Yeah. Or like, you know, if you if you take a look, especially in some of these uh, areas, just like in real life, we have capitals that are very close to one another, you know, like um, Europe and, and Russia or, you know, even in the United States, you know, Ontario uh, is a capital for the UK right next to New York in the U.S., and so people would, you know, rush capitals and things like that, because actually taking a capital is the only other way to earn points. It'll actually earn you two victory points if you take another player's capital region. So it is a way to try to win the game besides the, the victory cities we mentioned earlier. But if you lose a capital, you will also lose two points. So, you know, leaving your own capitals undefended to try to rush and take another player's capital really doesn't pay off usually. Big reward, big risk involved. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, I like that. Uh, definite uh, good playtesting on that. Um, before we move past combat, could you give us sure. an example just real quick of where the combat board is and how a, a basic combat, you know, a few infantry and some tanks, how that would work? Yeah, definitely. So if you come to the, all the way to the right, yeah, you're there. Uh, you'll see the the battle board. I'm just going to grab a few units here, um, and I'm going to place them down. And I'll I'll let you see if you can figure out where they go in the battle board. It's hopefully fairly. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Fairly uh, easy to understand. These should go there. And so we have the defender on the top and the attackers on the bottom. Yeah. Let's see, where's the fighter symbol up there? There it is. There you go. Yep. And strategic bomber should be there. Mm -hmm. Fighters, tanks, uh, infantry. Now, what's the difference between this infantry and this? Oh, this is jet supported infantry. So they would go there. Correct. Now we have it. It's a one to one. So in this case, you have two jets, so they would bring up two infantry. So the other two infantry would stay in the normal right there. Yep. And then in the defense, what we have is tanks normally defend at a two. If they are, again, one-to-one -one with infantry, then that brings those tanks up to a higher defense as well. I got you. So, you so there's a little bit of combined arms. It's Again, it's fairly basic. It's not getting into some of the real tactical detail that you know a lot of other war games get into. But there also there's so much else that goes into this game that, you know, it, it's not going to be, you know, uh, super detailed in every aspect of it, if that makes sense. No, no, no that makes perfect sense. You uh, get plenty of war games have bonuses for combined mm -hmm. arms, you know, mechanized infantry and tanks working together. And mm -hmm. I could see the, the bonus of attacking with air support. So it makes sense right. in the way you've uh, got it set up. Yeah. And, you know, defense with uh, having your your armor with infantry defense is definitely a, a good thing to have uh, as some, uh, some folks are finding out <laughs> recently uh, anyway. So then what we do is you add the dice for each unit. And here again, we have a real nice uh, script that's sort of uh, ready to go. So for example, if we take a look at, at the China side here, we have two infantry that are hitting at a one. So I'm going to go down here and press this little plus sign twice. And if you see that drops down two dice for me there, I can do two dice for these infantry. I have five of these guys and nothing there. If you want to go ahead and do the top for the attackers. Yep. Let's see, one, two, six, and just one for the bomber. So on defense, bombers are, yeah, not great. Got on it. offense, they're amazing, but on defense, not so much. Yep, I see it. So then what you can do is if you go ahead and hit that roll all button. Defender got three hits. I hit my roll all button. And the attacker got five hits. So that means you would have to remove five of your units. I would have to remove three of my units before we move on to the next round. So there's no canceling out. It's just whatever hit nope. you get is what you get. It's hits and hits. And again, the defender... You know, another thing, but the uh, the person losing gets to choose what they want to get rid of. Um, typically, you know, you want to lose infantry first; they're the cheapest. However, you need infantry to hold a territory, so in some cases, you might want to destroy a more valuable unit so that you have an infantry left over to actually hold on to the territory that you've that you've taken. Um, 
So it really just depends on your strategic goals as to kind of what units you want to remove. Oh, so only <laughs> infantry can control a territory. Yeah, as far as military goes, yep. Um, you need the infantry to kind of lock down the control of the country. I got it. And I see you're going to be using custom dice for the game itself. Yeah. So like, for example, the with a, a three, you know, that's going to hit. There are, uh, if you look at the die here, there are three symbols and the rest are, let me roll it again, they're blank, right? So if uh, the pip comes up, that's a hit. I like that. It's simple. It's easy to understand. Battleship yeah, you don't have to count quickly. dice. You don't have to like look at the numbers. It's just, is it a hit or is it not a hit? And each die is its own, you know, a, a four would have four pips on it. A three has three and so on. No, I like that. It's easy to understand. Battle should be able to be handled quickly. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. Yeah, surprisingly, yeah. battles usually takes is the what takes the least amount of time uh, in the game. All, all the, the, the constant, um, you know, uh, back and forth with players is what really ends up you know, eating the time up as, as you're playing through the game. Well, that's what it should be, though, when it comes mm -hmm. to this game, because uh, in combat is in every game. I expected it to be rather similar to some of the other stuff that we've seen. What's really setting you apart is what's taking the game to the next level. And that's mm -hmm. what's taking the most time. I mean, it should. Yeah. Yeah. So it, like I said, our, our big thing is this player interaction, like, you know, having that that fun between players and making those deals and, and everything else is really I think the bread and butter of the game. Awesome. All right. So where do we go from that? We go to our place units. So that's just going to be deploying the mm -hmm. uh, units that we purchased earlier. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, and as I mentioned before, um, you may place units only within those yellow capital regions. Um, and this is where what faction you choose can have kind of a big, big difference. Uh, Europe, for example, or China, they're very compact. If you notice, you know, all their capitals are fairly close together. So when they spawn their new units, they've got a lot of hardware all in one place that they can then strike out, you know, kind of in any direction. Whereas if you're playing, you know, the UK, um, they're spread out all over the world, you know, they're in, and actually they're the only faction that has five capitals rather than four because they are so spread out and kind of in a weakened position where it might be easy for someone to, you know, take a capital from them. Uh, so you're there in Canada, Africa, you know, uh, England, Australia, India. Um, so where they place their units might make a, they might have to think about that more than like a, a player who's playing China where all their capitals are really just right there in, in a pretty compact location. Have you noticed in the, the games that you've seen the, mm -hmm. the inherent and geological advantages that we see in real life? Like the fact that America is, basically sea locked right we don't really mm -hmm. have to worry about mexico attacking or canada for the most part except in this game we do have to worry about it yeah in this game yeah can the, the canada u.s border is not not the friendly largest peaceful border in the world um you know depending on who, who's playing right so uh yeah you do see that like the united states is uh, a bit more isolated um so one of the things we've done to sort of counteract that is when you initially place your units every uh, faction starts with two embassies that they're allowed to place, you know, around the globe. However, with the United States, uh, one of their embassies is already chosen for them and that's in Japan. So they only have one other embassy they get to place. So it all kind of automatically starts them at least with a little bit of conflict with China, so, you know, having that embassy right there. Oftentimes players, the USA player will drop a, a military base there to try to hold on to it because it is, uh, you know, eight GDP is is pretty high if, as far as uh, a neutral territory in the game. So having that and holding on to it is, and it's a victory point there as well. So um, conflict pretty much starts off a lot of times right away. I like that uh, you're, you're giving them a reason, like a realistic, real world reason to have mm -hmm. conflict in this area. That's a good choice. Yeah. Because otherwise, yeah, the United States would be just geographically very, very isolated. Um, the only other difference, I guess, with the, the, the factions, one thing I forgot to mention, the starting units, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. start with slightly more Navy and slightly less ground forces, uh, where the other three factions have slightly less Navy and slightly more ground forces, just based on kind of their their geography. Um, and that allows the U S and UK player to be able to transport units around a lot easier to early game without having to buy a lot more, uh, cruisers to, to, 
to move their infantry and tanks and things like that. Yeah. Otherwise they'd be slowed down trying to actually get involved anywhere across the map. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Oh, it's a good choice. I like it. One thing we haven't implemented yet, but one thing our players have definitely been asking for, and we just haven't had time to implement is custom loadouts. As far as what starting units you have, uh, we've had players say like, Oh, I wish I had a, a loadout that was more, you know, uh, air force heavy or one that was more, you know, tank heavy or something like that, rather than the basic loadouts that we have currently. Again, the only difference is between the United States, UK as the more Navy, less land, and then the others. Well, have you looked into the possibility of just giving each nation a set of resources, like X amount of money, X amount mm -hmm. of fuel, oil, all the resources and allow them to purchase their own starting forces? Yeah, that, that's definitely one possibility. Um, the only downside to that when we were looking at it is just it's more time at the beginning of the game where everyone's kind of thinking about what they want to do. Whereas if you just give them, you know, the uh, the units uh, like a maybe have a, you know, a land heavy, a Navy heavy, uh, an Air Force heavy, it's a little less thinking involved because that, that does tend to you get the analysis paralysis, if you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, that, that tends to happen a lot. In, in this game, especially because there are so many decisions to make, and uh, we've been trying to find ways to try to keep keep things moving too. But yeah, there's definitely a few options there. Like I said, we just haven't been able to implement that yet. But that is something that we may, you know, eventually do. Now, when it comes to the sequence of play, I think we've touched on most of it because we already talked about collecting the resources mm -hmm. and the bidding. So we would do those, the bidding for the next round. Is there anything else uh, that's touched on? There's a cleanup phase as well, correct? Yeah. So yeah, once you've, once all the combat's been uh, resolved, you should now, hopefully if, if you're lucky now have some more GDP and resources. So that's why the collection happens, you know, there at the very end, um, you just, you know, adjust your, your GDP markers, you, you know, grab any of the resources that you now control. Um, and then, yeah, then it goes on to the bidding for the next round and the whole thing starts over. Um, so that's really about it as far as the uh, the turns go. Now, there is a question I have to ask, and, and people agree, give me crap if I didn't ask this. <laughs> All right, because, go for it. Uh, my channel mainly revolves around is solitaire with the war games. So mm -hmm. have you guys looked into an AI bot system, something like that, uh, potentially to control one of the factions? So that's something that yeah is kind of, at least for me, kind of well above and beyond my uh, expertise uh, in doing. And with Tabletop, I don't know that there – if that is even a possibility. Somebody out there in your viewership might know that uh, more than I do. But yeah, it's definitely something that we've thought of. Like yeah, we'd love to be able to make it uh, able to be played you know either individually or with, with less players. But you know as of right now, like I mentioned before, it's – pretty much you know optimized or not optimized yet but it's we're working on balancing you know for the five players we've tried a couple games with with less and what ends up happening is it just becomes very unbalanced because right now you have you know let's say if you're europe you have you know a threat of russia on one side you have the threat of the uk on the other and if one of those is removed um, it gives you a much greater advantage over, let's say, if you're a Russian player who still has that Chinese threat on their southern border and now you to deal with. If you're free from you know, the, the UK threat, it's giving you a much greater advantage over that, that Russian player who still has to look at both fronts, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, perfectly. It'd be like Hitler only having to worry about the UK and not Russia during World War II. It would have right. changed up the whole name of the game. I get what you're saying. Now, that was kind of his fault, though, but yeah. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> no. uh, I got to say, like, I would want more than anything for this to have a solitaire aspect of it. But I think mm -hmm. what's really setting you apart is the stuff that isn't conducive to solitaire play. It's like we were talking about earlier, yeah. the wheeling and dealing, the people breaking off to separate channels, that one player left behind going, I'm getting ready <laughs> to get nuked. You know, that I, it, that's the most exciting part, I think, about this game. And I, I think you're right that that five mm -hmm. player having every person at that seat is really what's going to make this game shine. Yeah. And which, again, is at the same time, it, it does make it tough because, you know, trying to get five people together to play a game that that, that is, you know, 
the set. Well, luckily with with TTS, the setup really isn't that bad. You just load the game. Whereas you know on a real tabletop, this is going to be one of those you know make a day of it kind of things where you you set the board up. You know everybody's there doing their thing. So uh, again, that's why we try to make it as as little downtime as possible for players. That's why we you know kind of broke up the movement. Although not only does it do that, but having the movement broken up, I think actually adds a bit more tactics to the game um, where again, you know, the combat is fairly simple, but having that, I can only move my land units right now. You know, I can't then go make a decision and move my tanks later on. It's like there, that's it. Now I get to move my Navy. Now I get to move my air force um, does add a bit more flair to it that way. But yeah, you're, you're right. Going back to the point of the players, it's the, the player interaction, I think, is the biggest draw and biggest sell to to what we've got going on here. Well, speaking of the player interaction, um, I know we've got Discord available. Um, mm-hmm. How available is it for people to jump in now and get a game? Is just anyone welcome to join the Discord and apply to jump into one of the tabletop simulator games? Yes. Yeah, so um, currently we are in, in closed testing, so you can't just go to Tabletop Simulator, download the game and start playing it on your own. We would like we're going to eventually get to that point. But again, we don't want to put anything out there just generally to the public. That's not done. We, we want to have a, a finished, polished game before we you know go ahead and put it out. Um, so the way we do it right now is we have weekly test games, usually on Sundays, um, Currently, our, our, our weekly game is uh, 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern time in the U.S., but about half of our player base right now is uh, in Europe. About half is in the U.S., um, so that time is what we found is most conducive for everybody to, to kind of get together. Uh, but as our player base increases, which you know I hope it's going to do in the future, uh, we're going to try to open up some more um, – some more games. And so, uh, you know, currently we only have two, uh, the two developers, you know, myself and other uh, lead developer who have the, the game access to it. So we would, you know, host the server. Actually what l- lately we haven't really been playing a whole lot because we've had, you know, folks coming in and, and playing the game, which is great to just sit back and watch. Um, so if you want to join in a game, uh, join our discord server. Uh, we have a match setup um, channel in there where you can talk about, or you know, ask when the next game is, or uh, maybe ask about putting together. If you have a group of like you know five folks that you want to get together and play with, I am more than happy to try to accommodate you guys. Um, you know, week week nights are you know good for me sometimes if we have uh, some folks that want to play. But again, I'm based in the U.S. Not everybody's there. It, it can be tough sometimes. But um, you know, just reach out and and see. We'll we'll, we'll try to to get you guys. Uh, playing the game because we want to have as many people as we can testing it out and help us get to that point where we're able to kind of move forward with production and eventually having the, um, the, the TTS mod and the, the actual physical board game, which I think is going to be pretty amazing when it's done. Now I've only got uh, one question I did forget to ask earlier, Les, sure. if you don't mind. Uh, how long is a typical game? So a typical game is going to be several hours. Um, Oftentimes what happens is we'll, uh, we'll do our test game on Sunday. Uh, we'll play for a few hours. Uh, we'll save the game. We'll come back the next week and, you know, a couple more hours and then we'll finish it up. So if you've ever played, you know, one of those long form war games like, uh, access and allies, I would say it's fairly comparable. Um, and it also depends on the players. I mean, if you've got really aggressive players that are going for their, each other's throats right off the bat, your game's going to end a lot quicker than if you've got, you know, five turtles who just want to just keep building up their resources and, you know, everyone's kind of hesitating to take that, you know, uh, that final shot and sort of end things. It, it really would just, uh, again, depends on who's playing. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I definitely appreciate you sitting down and taking the time to uh, sit here and talk to me about the game. I know for me, I am very much excited about it. I'm definitely going to try to jump into one of these uh, Sunday games myself. Uh, For anyone who is interested, definitely check down in the description. I'm going to have all the links set up for you guys to the rules and anything that's readily publicly available now. uh, So you guys can find all the information that you're looking for there. And I definitely want to thank you again for taking the time to sit here with me and talk about your game, which is looking 
uh, absolutely phenomenal for what you guys have done so far. It is excellent. I cannot wait to see this hit the table. Uh, hopefully Kickstarter will come soon, but I understand you want to get it as ready as possible uh, before you take that next step. Yeah. And not only that, you know, I, just from the research, I'm, I'm very new to the uh, the board game production uh, world. So just from what I've found is that, you know, most folks saying, you know, successful Kickstarter, you kind of have to have to have your your base already there before you even, you know, decide to to start it. So, like I said, we want to get the game pretty much to that point. We're ready to go. We want to have that that big player base and, and you know folks that are you know ready to see it go forward uh, be- before we jump into that point. But I also just want to thank you for you know having some interest here and 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 helping me spread the word um, to people that you know would find this interesting. I, I understand this is good. this is a very niche game, right? It's you know especially not only just being you know a board game or, or on tabletop sim, but you know the whole. War game community is is a fairly you know uh, fairly it's, it's uh, a more niche. niche hobby. Yeah, uh, and speaking of the actual board game, um, when we do eventually go to print, our our plan is to have the actual game board as like a neoprene you know play mat, uh, and it's going to be fairly large. I think um, the uh, our other developer was imagining it's probably going to be close to a meter by two meters. So again, that's going to again make it for folks that, you know, have that big war gaming table in their basement and can really take the time and have it set up and, and leave it up for a while as, as a game actually progresses. So the more folks we can reach to try to get, you know, that audience of folks who would actually be interested in this, uh, the, the better it's going to be. Well, I'm definitely going to keep track myself and keep reporting on it as you guys develop and get closer to uh, publishing. And when you do get close to Kickstarter, I will definitely do some more coverage uh, to help get the word out for you guys because I am excited about it and I want to help out as much as I possibly can. I'd be greatly appreciated. Um, I'll just go ahead and also make a plug really quick for, you know, we have social medias like, you know, everyone kind of has to these days, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, again, Discord. Discord has all the information. So if you um, if you want to find out more about the mechanics and current rule books and all that, all that's on the Discord. Um, so that would be a great place to start. Yeah, and I'll tell you guys, the rule book I was anticipating being a lot more difficult than it originally was. I sat down, I went over it. Now, again, yes, this is early stage rule book. It's mm-hmm. not quite finalized yet, but we're we're close. Yeah. And it was not a hard read by any means. So don't look at this and think, oh my God, it's it's too much, it's too beefy for me, it's too much chrome. It's not. You can really learn this game in a short amount of time. It'll take you well under an hour to read the rules and you'll have a good grasp of them. It's not a hard game like that. No. And, and what we found is, you know, a lot of folks, they, they first see it. They think that they look and they're like, there's just so much going on here. There's no way I'm going to get this game. And within, yeah, within a, a few minutes of playing, like the, the basic mechanics are fairly simple and people uh, that have played have picked up on it. Like you said, very quickly. And uh, the, the fun thing is watching how, once they, they play, they really want to come back and, and play again. Um, so it, they, they get hooked on it pretty quick. And I think that all does boil down to the fact that there is so much player interaction. Yeah, you know, we have a, a kind of a nice community building up of uh, play testers that, you know, that now they're getting together and you know, playing other games stuff too because they're making friends, you know, within our, our community, you know, spending time playing this game. No, I, I don't blame them. I'm excited about it. Uh, is there any last words you want to ta- uh, toss in here before we get wrapped up? Uh, not that I can think of. I just, again, a thanks again for uh, for having us on here and, and, and just allowing me to share with you guys you know, what we've got going on. Like I said, it started off as just kind of a pet project between you know, two friends, and uh, it's really kind of snowballed from there. And, and uh, I'm definitely proud of what we have so far. You know, we've put a lot of time and effort into it, and – I said uh, Tequila, the uh, the graphic designer, the the lead dev, he's done some absolutely amazing work, and the time and effort that he's put into it um, is just absolutely phenomenal. I think I think he's definitely a master of his craft for sure. 
Well, I'll tell you what, I appreciate you taking the time to sit here with me. Uh, give me five minutes after I do my little wrap up here and uh, we'll go ahead and hop off. Guys, I appreciate you guys uh, watching this. I will have all the links down in the description. Make sure you go check it out. All the Twitter, Discord, social media, anything you're interested in, it'll be in the description. Hope you guys enjoyed the interview and I definitely appreciate Colonel Fetters taking and sitting with me for a little while. Y'all take care. I will see you in the next one.